So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, be invited uh, to speak as part of this series. It's great to see so many people here this evening, and I think it speaks to the importance of the issue that we have to talk about, uh, the subject matter, which unfortunately none of us, uh, which is relevant to all of us. So I want to speak for the next 30 to 35 minutes on the issue of the problem of pain. Pain is real, and it hurts. And the reality is that pain affects all of us, to some extent, to a variable degree. Just turn on the news, you hear about the tragedy of Ebola evolving in West Africa, war in the Middle East, and here at home, endless issues of child poverty, uh, sexual exploitation and human trafficking here in our own land. The issue of pain and evil is real for each one of us. So, as we begin to consider the issue, sort of the philosophical issues around pain, we have to ask ourselves, what is it in the first place that makes pain such a problem? Why does it bother us so much? Why, why are you guys here this evening? Why do you even care about pain? The reality is that the reason it's a problem is because suffering is evil. And things ought not to be this way. We care about suffering, we hate it, we fight back against it, because it's, it's, there's something wrong about it. That's what makes it a problem. So, it's important to recognize that when we call it evil, that means that we hold that suffering, is n this problem of pain, is not really a matter of taste. It's not that we find pain distasteful. It's not like country music, which I personally find distasteful. <laughs> I imagine some of you do as well. Maybe not everyone would agree, though. It's not like fried brain. And apparently this is available somewhere in the United States. No, when we look at the case of horrific suffering and evil, like when you see and hear about the story of Jeffrey Baldwin, a little boy starved um, and terribly abused by his own grandparents to the point that he died in a room covered with his own urine and feces, we look at that and say, no, that's not just a matter of distaste. There's something seriously wrong here. This is evil, and it's qualitatively different. It's not just a matter of taste. Things ought not to be this way. And so this is fundamentally important, that we understand the significance of evil and what we're mean by evil when we come to consider this problem. Now, the reality is that evil, for many people, counts as evidence against God. Bertrand Russell, renowned atheist, defender of the atheist faith, wrote that no one can sit at the bedside of a dying child and still believe in God. If you look at that dying child, you have to wonder, how is this fair? How is this right? How can this be permitted? And the natural human reaction in the flesh is to cry out against it in anger, in grief, to rage. But the reality is that this is not merely a problem for Christians. Every worldview must bear the weight of suffering. Now I imagine that there's a range of worldviews represented in this room. When I use the term worldview, I'm talking about a global set of uh, beliefs that you hold that fundamentally characterize the way that you look at the world. So some of you believe in God, some of you don't. Some of you might be pantheists, believing that God and the universe are the same thing. There's probably a range of worldviews characterized in this room, but no matter which one of those views that you would fundamentally adopt, each of us must answer to this problem. So I want to very quickly point out the issue of pain for atheism. Christopher Hitchens, shortly before he died, wrote in his book, Mortality, to the dumb question, why me? The universe barely bothers to respond, why not? The reality is that under atheism, there is no problem of evil because there is no ultimate standard by which we can say 
that there is something clearly wrong by which we can differentiate between good and evil. It dissolves because the word evil has no meaning in an atheist worldview. Human life has no absolute to be violated. If God is dead, life is utterly absurd. Sitting at the bedside of a dying child, the atheist can only reassure us that, as Richard Dawkins so eloquently put it, the universe that we observe is precisely the properties we should expect if there is at bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. That is the necessary corollary of an atheist worldview. There is no evil, there is no good, only indifference. And so, for the atheist, one can simply sit at the bedside of a dying child and say, really? Why should I care? What's wrong about this? That would be the question I have for the atheist. Yeah. But of course, every worldview must bear the weight of the suffering. We could speak of how this is a problem not merely for atheists, but for pantheists, as well as for theists like myself. So let's now move to how pain is a problem for the Christian worldview. And the reality is that we must face this problem head on. We can't run from it, we can't hide from it, we can't deny it. The Christian worldview clearly provides grounds on which to say that one thing is good and another thing is evil. And consequently, we have to provide some reconciliation for God and evil. Now the problem of evil or suffering can be divided into two basic types of issues. So the first one is, how can God exist if evil exists? That's what I'll call the philosophical problem. And then the second problem is, if God is there, why am I allowed to suffer? That's what I'll call more of the emotional problem of evil. And I use the word emotional not to de denigrate the problem, but simply to point out that it's a different, fundamentally different, and probably more important problem for us than the philosophical problem. But let's first begin with treating the philosophical problem. How can God exist if evil exists? And this is basically the claim that it is illogical to say that God can coexist with evil. There's a logical contradiction built into the statement that God can coexist with evil. And so, consequently, our focus moves away not from understanding why pain occurs so much to simply examining sort of uh, premises in a sort of very philosophical, almost mathematical kind of way. And the argument fundamentally runs like this. If God exists, Evil cannot exist. Evil exists, therefore, God does not exist. But just to fill out the argument a little bit, to understand how people arrive at this conclusion, there is a number of premises that we can put together. So first of all, if God exists, we understand him or believe him to be all-knowing, all-good, and all-powerful. Secondly, an all-knowing being would have to be aware of all evil, Thirdly, an all-good being would have to uh, prevent as much evil as he possibly could. An all-powerful be being would be able to prevent all evil. Therefore, if God exists, evil would not exist. Evil does exist, therefore, uh, that actually should say God, ex God does not exist. There's an error there on my slide, I apologize. So, this is basically how the argument runs. It's classically formulated by a Greek philosopher, Epicurus and reworded by David Hume and offered a number of different formulations uh, today. But that essentially is how the argument is structured. So the question then is, how do we respond to this? Now, um, the Christian responses to this can be divided into two basic categories, a theodicy and a defense. A theodicy is a, is a kind of answer in which one undertakes to show precisely what reasons God has for suffering such that he could be good and evil can exist. It's a very difficult project to undertake. But the second category of response is called a defense. And in that category, all that's necessary is for one to provide further premises such that the conclusion doesn't necessarily follow from all the other premises. And I don't even have to prove the truth of the premise that I provide. I simply have to suggest it and show that this would have to be proven to be false in order for the conclusion still to follow. Let me give you an example of one of the premises that one might introduce to uh, show that the conclusion doesn't necessarily follow. 
And that simply is what I've entitled here number five. An all wise being may have uh, morally sufficient reasons to permit evil to exist. And if that's true, then God and evil might coexist. And therefore, we couldn't conclude from the premises above that God does not exist. So that's a, that's a defense. So all I have to do is throw out there that God might have a morally sufficient reason. I don't even have to provide the reason. But the burden of proof now lies with the atheist to show that there is no possible way in which God could have a morally sufficient reason for evil. And universally, philosophers of religion have acknowledged that that is an impossible task. Therefore, there is no logical problem of evil, per se. So, that is essentially how I would address the logical version of this problem. Now, it has also been formulated in a slightly weaker, but probably more challenging version, the so-called evidential problem. And that is basically to simply claim it is highly improbable that God can coexist with evil. In other words, given the horrific and apparently gratuitous evil all around us, it is highly unlikely that God can have a morally sufficient reason for permitting evil. You might want to throw out there that God might have a uh, morally sufficient reason for evil. And sure, maybe I can't absolutely definitively prove that he does it. But it looks to be, as I look around the world, the way the suffering I've experienced, the suffering all around us, that it seems very unlikely that God could have a morally sufficient reason for permitting evil. And therefore, I still think that given evil, it's highly improbable that God uh, does not exist given evil. The key issue here uh, is one of how confident are we in our epistemic and cognitive capacity to identify what reasons there might be for permitting evil and then rule them out such that they are improbable. The, the central issue is how confident can we be that we can tell if God has a morally sufficient reason for evil or not. What makes us think that if God had a morally sufficient reason for evil, that we would be able to discern it? Uh, that we would be able to identify what it is or even estimate the probability that he might have such a reason? Remember, when we're making this argument, we're proceeding from a Christian understanding of who God is, an all-knowing, an all-good, an all-powerful, um, an all-wise being. We're granting those conditions and then saying, clearly, given those conditions, if evil exists, that God couldn't exist. So we also need to understand that if we want to use evil as evidence against that kind of God, we, would, we also have to recognize that his intelligence, his wisdom, his sovereign ability to plan are so, uh, so far above our own that we don't really have any grounds to think that we would be able to discern what reasons God might or might not have for permitting evil or to claim that it's improbable that such a, a reason would exist. Now, the classic biblical story undergirding this type of skepticism is the story of Job. I'm sure most of you know the story of Job. Job was a righteous man, one who worshipped and obeyed God, and God was pleased. And nevertheless, Satan came and claimed, told God that, you know, I bet you this guy, he, he's happy to worship you because you're good to him, and you're very nice to him, and you allow him everything he wants. You know, he's very comfortable. Why wouldn't he worship you? And so God, uh, in a sort of uh, celestial contest, permits Satan to work all kinds of evil in Job's life. He, uh, Satan organizes the murder of his children, the theft of all his goods, and, the, uh, um, and even the illness in Job's own life. He, uh, we don't exactly know what kind of a condition he had, but nevertheless, he was clearly suffering. His own wife told him, Job, just curse God and, God and die. Why, you know, why would you want to have anything to do with a God who allow this in your life? And Job, although he upholds uh, 
He is unwilling to question God throughout the book. Un un though he he's unwilling to call God evil throughout the book, he does question God. He says, why are you allowing this to happen to me? And here in Job chapter 10, verses 1 to 3, Job says, I will give free utterance to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, do not condemn me. Let me know why you contend against me. Job says, I want to understand what reasons you might have for permitting the evil and suffering in my life. And so God's response is, eventually uh, God comes and reveals himself to Job and spends about two chapters near the end of Job just uh, opening his eyes to God's how much higher and greater and wiser God is compared to Job himself. God says, who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge, dressed for action like a man? I will question you and you make it known to me. God then goes on to recite uh, all his works in creation, the wisdom, power, and might that he displayed to emphasize to Job that he is so much higher above him. And so Job can't even begin to expect to understand the reasons that God might have. God says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who has put wisdom in the inward parts or given understanding to the mind? So Job finally is brought, uh, is humbled, brought to his knees, and he says, Behold, I am a small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. So the appropriate response to uh, the, problem, the question, do I have the capacity to discern what God's reasons should be or whether he has any good reasons is simply one of humility to recognize that God and his wisdom, power, and might is so high above us, so far beyond us, that it is incredibly arrogant of us, his creatures, to expect to be able to discern his reasons. This is a category of response known as theistic skepticism. Now, we move then to the emotional problem. And this is actually, I think, the problem of suffering and evil that troubles people far more greatly than the philosophical problem. Once in a while, I run into someone who can recite the premises of the argument against God's existence given evil, but most people aren't that sophisticated. Rather, they just simply say, you know what, I've got all this suffering and evil in my life. Why does God allow it if he's around? Why does he, doesn't he care about me? I think that's the bigger problem and the more pressing problem for many people. So the question then is, do we have any reasons to think that God is very likely to have a morally sufficient reason for our suffering? Is there any evidence to vindicate God? When we ask such questions, we are examining God's integrity, his trustworthiness. In essence, we are asking, can God be trusted even when we're suffering? Fundamentally, I believe that certain truths of the Christian faith provide the kind of counter evidence against suffering that we're looking for. While we may not have an answer to every question, core Christian truth claims provide powerful resources to understand and transcend pain. In the time remaining, I want to examine these beliefs. First, creation and fall. The Bible teaches that God's creation was originally unintentionally without blemish. God created the world and pronounced each stage very good. It was beautiful, it was free, it was unblemished by pain or suffering. God created humanity in perfect harmony with himself. We were in a state of innocence, blissfully unaware of even the possibility of evil. Thus, the universe was not meant to be a place of brokenness and grief, and that our hearts now cry out against evil so quickly reveals echoes of a time before paradise was lost. So what happened? Where and how in the biblical story does evil arise? Evil arose from humanity's rebellion against God's authority. Our forefather Adam preferred to choose for himself what was good and evil. This repudiation of God's goodness and authority represents the very core of every sin, the de-godding of God so that we step into his place and become the ultimate authority. This cosmic rebellion shattered our relationship with God and brought upon us the cursed effects of sin. 
Romans 5.12, sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. This does not mean that all of our suffering is the direct punishment of God for individual sins. The Bible makes that very clear. But ultimately, at a cosmic level, the brokenness of our universe is the fruit of human rejection of God, in which we have all played a part. What then is the solution? While throughout history, humans have sought a cure for the human condition through various religious and philosophical systems, the Bible reveals a far more radical and unthinkable solution, the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ reveals the character of God as no other act could, and it is at the cross, an ancient symbol of ultimate pain, that we find evidence to trust God with our pain. For in the biblical story, it was God himself in the person of Jesus who hung on that cross, enduring mockery, humiliation, injustice, and suffering of unthinkable proportion. The cross reveals in the first place that God knows and understands our pain. He shares our pain. Far from being aloof and arrogant, cold and uncaring, as he is often advertised, in Jesus, God walked in our very midst. He knew hunger, fear, rejection, pain, loneliness, grief, and loss. Hanging on that cross, Jesus knew the gut-wrenching pangs of unjust suffering. For only hours earlier, he had been convicted and sentenced by a kangaroo court for the unprecedented crime of claiming to be the Son of God. Mysteriously, on that cross, we see Jesus struggling to comprehend the will of God, just as we do. My God! My God, why have you forsaken me? The New Testament letter to the Hebrews records, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect is tempted, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. In the second place, the cross reveals the unsearchable and unthinkable love of God. We might imagine ourselves in that crowd, standing before the lonely disfigured and broken man hanging on the cross. He appears tormented by an awful hunger for air, each breath a mighty struggle. At such a moment, the universe might indeed seem absurd and purposeless and empty. And yet it was no accident that Jesus was hanging on that cross, for Jesus predicted his own crucifixion and resurrection several times in the days and weeks leading up to that fateful day. What then could have motivated Jesus to deliberately go to the cross? Hear what Jesus himself said. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, Jesus said, Greater love is no one than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. The Son was the very treasure of the Father. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And yet at the cross... Out of love toward us, the Father turned his face away from his own Son, and the Son went to the cross willingly and deliberately out of love toward us. At the cross, both God the Father and God the Son display the unthinkable fullness of their love toward us as enemies. Romans 5, verse 8, God shows his love for us, that in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Finally, the cross reveals the seeming paradox of the justice and mercy of God. Evil is not merely a pressing philosophical and emotional problem for us. Evil is a problem of even greater consequence for God. On the one hand, God's justice and holiness demands that evildoers must be punished and that evil must be eradicated. Ezekiel 18.20 states, The soul who sins shall die. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. The scriptures are very clear that each one of us is guilty of sin and rebellion against God, and that each of us stands condemned. None of us have loved God with heart, soul, and mind the way that we ought to have. None of us have loved our neighbor as ourselves. In thought and word and deed, our lives affirm the words of the prophet Isaiah, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. We do not merely experience the problem of evil. We participate in it. And if God were to simply wipe out evil, 
and its causes, we would also be wiped out. And yet that is precisely what God does not want to do. Psalm 145 verse 9 says, Yahweh is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. He says, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn uh, from his way and live? The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk speaks to this tension in God between justice and mercy when he pleads in wrath, remember mercy. But how can God be both wrathful and merciful? The answer lies in the cross. At the cross, the justice of God is on full display as his wrath against sin is poured out on a willing substitute, the perfectly righteous, infinite Son of God, the only one qualified to bear away the sins of the world. Yet here at the cross, the mercy of God is also on full display as God finds a way to save humanity, the crowning glory of creation, from the real problem of evil. And again, Isaiah prophesied, he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. At the cross, we find reasons for the heart to accept that God can be trusted in the face of suffering. Here we see with crystal clarity that God sympathizes with us, that he is humble, that he loves us, that he is just, and that he is merciful. He paid the highest price to make a way to rescue us from the problem of evil, and he has triumphed over death, giving us a reason to hope for something better than brokenness. At the cross, we discover that God is for us. The renowned Christian pastor and teacher John Stott wrote these words in his seminal work on the cross of Christ. I could never myself believe in God if it were not for the cross. The only God I believe is the one Nietzsche ridiculed as God on the cross. In the real world of pain, how could one worship a God who was immune to it? I have entered many Buddhist temples in different Asian countries and stood respectfully, respectfully before the statue of the Buddha, his legs crossed, arms folded, eyes closed, the ghost of a smile playing around his mouth, a remote look on his face, detached from the agonies of the world. But each time after a while, I have had to turn away. And in imagine I have turned and said to that lonely, twisted, tortured figure on the cross, nails through hands and feet, back lacerated, limbs wrenched, brow bleeding from thorn pricks, mouth dry and intolerably thirsty. That is the God for me. He laid aside his immunity to pain. He entered our world of flesh and blood, tears and death. He suffered for us. Our sufferings become more manageable in the light of his. There is still a question mark against human suffering, but over it we boldly stamp another mark, the cross that symbolizes divine suffering. The cross of Christ is God's only self-justification in such a world as ours." End quote. The story does not end at the cross. The New Testament records report that Jesus rose from the dead three days after his crucifixion, Vindicated before the world and victorious over death. He demonstrated God's eventual triumph over the problem of evil. Jesus is risen and alive and he has promised one day to return and judge the world and to restore all things. 2 Peter 3 verse 13 promises, according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Paradise will be regained. Ultimate justice will be done and will be seen to be done. All our questions will be answered. In the words of J.R. Tolkien, everything sad is going to come untrue. God's greatest joy will be realized when he dwells again in perfect harmony with his redeemed people. In the words of Revelation 21, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. This is the Christian hope, and this is why I believe that God will ultimately triumph over the problem of pain. To summarize, can the Christian worldview bear the weight of suffering and pain? I think yes. The cross and the empty tomb <laughs> 
give reasons for the heart to trust God, to be confident that God is for us, and to be sure that paradise will be regained. The gospel of Jesus Christ is in fact very, very good news. If God is really like the Bible says he is, if this is really true, then he very likely has a morally sufficient reason for evil and suffering, and he can be trusted in the midst of our pain. The problem of evil and suffering are thus no final obstacle to belief in God of Christianity. If anything, the evil and suffering we all see and know should drive us to the God of the cross and the empty tomb, embracing forgiveness for our sins and finding hope for eternal life in Him. For those of you who have not yet accepted the gospel, I hope that these things will move you from doubt to hope and that you will seek to know the one who loved us and gave himself for us. Thank you very much. I gotcha. Thank you. Okay. Uh, apologies. Thank you for uh, being willing to come up and uh, to be clear. So, uh, um, I, I fully recognize that there is not an atheist in this world who doesn't believe that evil exists. So, what I mean by that is to say that every atheist out there believes that there is evil. And so, I... I uh, fully acknowledge that simply because one is an atheist doesn't mean that one has no belief that evil exists. But the question is, has to do with the grounds for the claim that something is evil. And not really, and I think that's okay, you can just leave it off. Um, and this was fundamentally my point in the, in the first part of the talk. Because to claim that something is evil is to say much more than that it is distasteful. And one cannot move simply from the distastefulness to the evil without invoking some standard by which that thing can be judged to be evil. To do so, people do this all the time, would be an example of the naturalistic fallacy, the is-ought problem. You cannot move from the way things are to the way they ought to be. So, merely uh, saying that I could say that fried brain is evil, but I'd have to have some universal standard by which to say that there should be no fried brain in the world. Now, there might be social consensus around that, but even that would be sufficient to ground the claim that fried brain is evil. But when we look at the case of Jeffrey Baldwin that followed, we all agree that children ought to be treated with respect and dignity that they should be provided for, that they should be loved and nurtured, those are ought statements. Those are not statements about the character of Jeffrey Baldwin's experience. They're invoking a larger universal standard by which Jeffrey Baldwin's experience can be judged to be wrong. Now the question I have for you, Anna, is where do you, what, what universal standard would you invoke to call one thing evil and another good? So you said law, morality, and what? And, and, and conscience. Okay. So, <coughs> um, with respect to law, um, law clearly doesn't provide grounds for morality. Rather, law is built upon, we hope, morality. But merely because something's wrong, 
doesn't mean, merely because something's illegal doesn't mean that it's wrong. So for example, currently many um, people across this country are advocating for the legalization of euthanasia. And they clearly believe that euthanasia is morally permissible. And so the mere fact that something would be illegal gives you real no grounds to decide whether something's right or wrong. Um, the third thing I'm going to address, conscience. I agree with you again that humans have moral cognition, the capacity to recognize evil when it is. But the question that again has to be asked is, why should I have any respect for your conscience? What if your conscience discerns something uh, to be evil that I discern to be good? So I uh, let's uh, suppose that I have uncontrollable uh, sexual desires for animals, okay? Or for young children. Now, you would clearly say that that's an evil and I should be prevented from doing it. Okay, well, um, maybe I'm taking too much for granted. Many people would. There is probably someone in this room whose conscience would suggest that that's wrong. I hope that yours does as well. We can talk more afterwards. The, um, <laughs> The, uh, the, the fundamental issue is, why should I respect anybody else's conscience on this matter? If these are merely subjective uh, musings of the human mind. Moreover, if it is the case that humans um, evolve purely by chance, why is it that we trust the conclusions of our quote-unquote minds, by which we actually mean brains at all? Darwin himself said, with me lies the horrid doubt wondering why should I think that the conclusions of my mind are any more reliable than that of a monkey's. So atheism fundamentally undermines any reason I have to trust the conclusions of the human brain to begin with. So I don't, so for that reason, law and conscience don't apply. Now the second category you mentioned was morality, but that begs the question, because what we're talking about is whether morality is possible apart from some universal standard, which could only be supplied by a monotheistic creator. So that would be my response to your, to your argument. So I think fundamentally what has to be recognized is that when we call something evil, we're invoking a higher standard that transcends our own subjective experience and cannot really be an issue of aesthetics. I don't like that. It has to actually be something that violates a universal standard of good and evil. Question over there. So you said that if God were to get rid of all evil, that we would have to get rid of all people, so I think doing including myself, which obviously I don't want. Um, so why couldn't he just get rid of, like, and it sounds like a stupid question, but why can't he just get rid of the really bad sins, like murder, for instance? Hmm. That's, a, that's a great question. What's your name? Matthew. Matthew. Okay, thanks, Matthew. So, um... I, I'm going to preface my response to that by first commenting on the fact that I'm invoking a great deal of Christian theology to address this issue. And many people will say, you know, that's not appropriate, given that I don't accept all those beliefs. And my response to that would be, I think it's appropriate to invoke Christian theology because the question that's being posed here is, can God, can God exist if evil uh, exists? takes for granted a great deal of Christian theology, like I said earlier, that he's all-knowing, all-good, all-wise. So the question is, is, there, is, there, is the Christian worldview internally consistent and coherent, or is it um, self-contradicting? So if I have no ability to reconcile God's existence with evil, then the Christian worldview would be self-contradicting. So that means that I'm permitted to marshal all the resources of all Christian beliefs in order to understand how suffering and, and God can coexist. So, so that's why my response here is going to be grounded again in a biblical understanding of what evil is. Your cat, certainly there is clearly biblical categories for worse sins and less, lesser sins. But the critical issue, and I think this is fundamentally a misunderstanding that many pet people have the nature of sin, is that sin doesn't merely pertain to deeds. Sin is not merely an issue of, oh, I broke this rule and that rule. Sin is not just the breaking of the Ten Commandments. Sin is fundamentally how you align yourself with respect to God. Do you live your, your life in a way that demonstrates that you worship Him 
you acknowledge who he is, that his authority, his lordship, his goodness, that you recognize that, as the Apostle Paul said on Mars Hill in, in, in ancient Greece, that in him we live and move and have our being. And the moment that we stop doing that, we have entered into that cosmic rebellion. So, while we might perceive of one person's actions, the grandparents of Jeffrey Baldwin, to be very serious evil, and I fully agree with you, we must not forget that within the Christian worldview, God's fundamental command is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself, and to the extent that none of us can even come close to approximating that standard. We are all under divine judgment. So that is why if God was to judge evil this very instant and to judge the perpetrators of evil, we would all be judged and damned and condemned. And it's his grace continually poured out on humanity that withholds that judgment. It's a very solemn thing to claim, I, I recognize, but I think that's what the Bible teaches. Another question in the back. Do you want to, you want to come up to the front? Yeah. yeah, talk on the mic. So can hear. My name is Constantine. I want to say that uh, I think you gave a lot of very good reasons why existence of evil shouldn't be used as a proof of this existence of God. And I agree with you that it, like, it isn't a valid proof of the God existence. Um, however, I, like, within your talk, I, I couldn't find reasons why I should believe in that. Mm. Because um, basically, like, one, one of the main points of yours was that we we as humans are ultimately unable to understand God's ways. So, uh, for example, if an atheist uh, doesn't, doesn't believe in God, then he, as, as you said, um, he's, he's a victim of moral relativism and uh, he, he, there is no boundary between good and evil. Mm -hmm. But if, if we can't understand God, then uh, how can how, how can we be sure that um, that nothing bad will happen to us, or how can we be sure that we interpret the scripture correctly, or how can we how can we be sure that uh, you know like for example God wants only vegetarians to go to heaven and everybody who who eats meat will go to hell, mm. and uh, God does not say that explicitly in the Bible because you know He's God and He can't understand. But that's that's what he wants. How how can you be sure that you know the scripture is true? Mm. Uh, how can you be sure that at some point grief will not just fall fall on your head? In other words, I think that uh, your interpretation of that has the same amount of moral relativism and unpredictability as uh, you know just un unprecedented. Mm. So there's, 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 Right. All right. Thank you. That that was an excellent question. I was hoping someone would ask. Um, her, yeah. Sure. So ho hopefully I get this right. The question essentially is, okay. So perhaps the Christian worldview isn't entirely self-contradictory with, with respect to the issue of God and evil. But nevertheless, that doesn't really mean that I should adopt that view. Um, and the argument basically is, is if all I'm doing is accepting the world, the Christian worldview at face value, I'm not really any closer to truth or to um, being right or um, having any higher moral standard than anybody else. I hope that that's a proper interpretation of the question. The, the important point is that if you can't understand God, mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. That's a that's a that's a that's a that's the critical question. 
So um, let me begin by saying this, that my conception, and I think most Christians' conception of faith, is fun fundamentally different than how non-believers conceive of faith. In fact, I was just having lunch yesterday with um, a prominent uh, political philosopher here in the city and, and his colleague, and they were shocked to learn that my, their understanding of faith was completely different than my own. And I, unfortunately, I think that much religious faith in this world is characterized simply as blind faith. Faith that presumes what it wants to believe, that takes it for granted that it's true virtually, basically by virtue of the fact that people want it to be true. So much faith in this world is essentially that, what I'll call blind faith. The way that I think properly uh, functioning faith works is the exact same way that the faith is exercised by a member of a jury during a trial, when they make decisions about whether or not they can trust the witness evidence. The jury and the jurors could not see the crime committed for themselves. They weren't there. They have no access to the primary experience of witnessing the crime. So they have to evaluate the evidence provided by witnesses and the arguments provided by the lawyers and decide whether they can trust a given witness about the evidence that's being provided. And that is the kind of faith that Christianity itself says should be exercised. So when, um, uh, at the beginning of the Gospel of Luke, Luke says, I'm writing to you, my friend Theophilus, to give you an orderly account of the history of what happened so that you might have certainty about the things that you believe. He's trying to provide some warrant or justification. Now, for the Apostle Peter said that Christians should always be ready to give reasons for the things that they believe. So I fully, all of this to say, I fully accept the significance of this question. Faith that is not evidence-based is irrational and ought to be rejected. I fully agree with you. So that raises the question, are, are there any good reasons to think that we have, can know God and know what he wants in, in any reliable fashion? Now, Christians understand that God has revealed himself to us in two ways, general revelation and specific revelation. And a number of arguments can be constructed for God's existence purely by virtue of the world around us. So, for example, why is there something rather than nothing? That's a question that many um, who, who study apologetics and arguments for and against God's existence love to tackle. But fundamentally, there is no good explanation for the existence of something other than an eternally pre-existing creator. That's the only rational explanation. Um, why um, did the, uh, the world come into existence? We know that the universe has a finite period of existence, and at the point of its, be uh, of its beginning, before that it didn't exist. There's space and time are finite. And we know that anything that begins to exist must have a cause. And you can quickly go down the possible causes of space and time, none of which can be space and time themselves. And the most rational explanation for space and time is an eternally existing, immaterial, personal, all-powerful creator. That's the best explanation. The fine-tuning of the universe, the evidence of design all around us, the information bearing properties of biological molecules. All of these naturally occurring phenomena speak volumes about the existence of a creator, but as Romans chapter one says, that uh, we naturally suppress the truth and the righteousness. We don't want to recognize what's staring us in the face. So that's general revelation. Now, specific revelation is where God speaks to us in language, and that's the question of, is there any good reason to believe that the Bible is a divinely inspired document? And, uh, you know, we can go on at length about that. But I'll give you two critical pieces of evidence. First, the dramatic fulfillment of prophecy. Um, Isaiah 53, which we have copies of that predate the existence of Jesus in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, clearly prophesied one, as I even quoted earlier, who would come and offer himself as a sacrifice for sin. Um, that he would be uh, beaten and wounded. Psalm 22, 
prophesies about someone essentially being crucified, marks and hands and feet, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That people would um, cast lots over the crucified one's clothes. These are, these are, you can go look yourself, these are there. And we know that these things in, li in literature predate the time of Jesus. No, um, uh, no real scholar would dispute that. Now, the question is, how is it that we can explain the fact that these prophecies are so clearly fulfilled in the life of Jesus. The naturalist who's committed to explaining all things through natural mechanisms has to say, well, there, there has to be some other explanation. I might not know it, but there has to be some other explanation. But they say that by virtue of their faith in their own presuppositions, that only that everything has a natural explanation. But I look at that and I simply say the best explanation of the fulfillment of these prophecies is that that's God speaking. And there are many other examples that I can point you to in terms of fulfilled prophecy. And finally, the resurrection of Jesus is subject to historical examination. And I obviously don't have the time and the space to enter into that now, but the fact that Jesus entered into history, died and rose again, we have good historical reasons to believe that he rose from the dead, again gives us reasons to certify and warrant the claims that his followers are making about him. So I have lots of good reasons to think that God exists, that he um, speaks to us, and in particular has revealed himself through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. I think you have a follow-up question. Asking whether God exists or not, or what are the reasons why he exists. I'm asking how can I be sure that I will not go to hell if I don't understand what God wants, because God has history of tricking people and doing stuff which is unexplainable. But how, how can I sure how can I be sure that I don't sin if, if I don't if I don't know what what God what, what is God's conception of sin? How can I be sure that what priest tells me is is the right thing to do? Suppose suppose God exists. How you know how how can I be sure that I do anything good in my life if I can't understand that? Yeah, precisely. Just to repeat the question for everyone. The question is, suppose God exists, how can I be sure that I can understand what he wants and that I'm actually going to make it to heaven and meet his demands? Exactly, yeah. He's so, I've already said, as I've said, he's so high above us, so above our, and his ways are so far above our own intelligence. I, I think that's why I went to the issue of special revelation. Because if it is the case that God has spoken to us clearly in words, and revealed uh, his will and design and his plan of salvation in words and through the life of Christ, then I have good, that gives me good reason to think that I can understand and, and meet his demands. That would, that would simply be my answer. God had to reveal himself to us in words. The question then, of course, is whether you will accept that God has revealed himself to us in words. And that's where the evidence for the inspiration of the Bible fulfill prophecy, miracles, resurrection, etc. have become so critical to examine. All right, thank you very much to all of you for uh, a great session. Thank you.